morning, everyone. How is, how is the day today? It's a brilliant day, not so cold. So, and for those who are coming from the East Coast. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about a fun topic, for me at least, and I hope it is fun for you. It's something that we took on during our running our medical serve radiology grand challenge. But I thought this was an appropriate forum to discuss it so you could see what does it take to build a, a, a data science application from end to end. I just want to acknowledge my team, and you can see that there are clinicians, machine learning researchers, data scientists, um, medical imaging researchers, you name it, you need all of them to pull off something like this. So you might say, where is the field of radiology today? Right from the time when we did our Eyes of Watson exhibit at uh, RSNA, uh, that just stirred up the field of radiology saying, oh my, AI is coming to replace us. And then both radiologists and AI companies got into the fray, and you can see a lot of them still maybe around and trying to make money. Uh, but, uh, and a lot of FDA cleared products also are there. But adoption in radiology workflows is still slow. And if you see why is that the case, it's because it's, it doesn't help them if you just do a few of these findings. You want to be able to cover at least one modality in its entirety to get somewhere. And the kind of reports you may generate from there, just saying what the labels are is not good enough for uh, replacing in their clinical workflows. So in the Medical Serve Radiology Grand Challenge, which was targeted towards building AI assistants that are provably good enough, um, this problem was posed to us. Can you pick one modality, such as a chest x-ray, and do a full preliminary read? And to be done at the level that I couldn't distinguish between a human read and a machine read. So if you've got a chest x-ray, you need to get to the right. And you can see over there that there is very fine grained descriptions of findings with laterality, location, and so on. So this was our task. Now you may say, why chest x-rays? So these are obviously, they are the most common imaging exams. So obviously, maybe there is a business case for it. But you'll see that we took it for a different reason. But then the more important thing was, in a data science problem, labels are somehow known or given. But in this particular case, we had no idea how many findings are there if we have to claim coverage of all. And then we had to say, if we had to be better than the radiologists, we needed to know how good are the radiologists themselves. And then the third thing is, if you make all of those, can you now describe the findings in a way that is natural looking, that you couldn't really tell who did it? So here you can see the reason we took on with these are, even though they're the most common, they're some of the hardest to interpret. They could have technical assessment issues. This is what a radiologist has to look through as they go through their workflow. These are not technically ready to interpret. Then there are things that are opacities, which are all essentially what they try to interpret and know whether the opacities are due to consolidation or at electasis. Um, then you go over and look at tubes and lines that may be present, particularly if you're in an AP in, uh, at an in-hospital environment, whether the lines and tubes are placed, and you want to know what type of line and tube is it. Is it a nasogastric tube, or is it an IJ line, or a Swan-Gans catheter? Then you need to know whether there are any implants and uh, um, things that you may have want to interpret from opacities to distinguish between whether there's a nodule or it's just an opacity of some other kind. So you can see that this is a very hard problem. And in order to build something that at AI scale, you want to address many different problems, not just for AI, which we know we have to do, but also on the radiologist side, setting up the benchmarks and establishing well ways of defining ground truth and to measure their performance and then measure machines' performance as well. So let me show how we actually do this right now. So if I can run, here's an image that comes in. The system can actually interpret, extract the anatomical regions. And as it starts assessing, it can spit out a report that looks like that. And you can just pick up any image and try to send it as a service. It interprets and, and, and gives a result like this. And the images could be pretty bad, as you can see from here. These are web images. And then there are findings discussed in there. 
Okay, so let's go to the first question. We have to know what are the findings and how many findings are there. This was a cataloging exercise that required extensive clinician work time and bringing data from both textbooks as well as from uh, data driven from uh, reports, looking at reports. And we did an extensive cataloging of findings, over 2,000 findings when you look at it at a very fine-grained level. But even if you roll up, there is considerable number of findings, much larger than what typically people use with the 14 labels that you see for uh, NIH data set that is out there and all the derivatives. The second thing was to be able to acquire multi-institutional data sets. And these are data sets that come from um, a variety of hospitals, both national and international. So you could have distributions, different incidence distributions. And as you can see from the instance, incidence distributions, not all findings are occurring as commonly. So you need to build machines that can tolerate such imbalance in data as well. Then the next thing is to be able to label. Much of this data that's available is unlabeled. And even if it is labeled, it's only for 14 findings. When you're talking about 2,000 findings, how are you going to label such data sets? Manual labeling was nearly impossible. So we needed to develop very good methods for using the companion radiology reports to be able to interpret. And here's where the chest X-ray lexicon that we developed came in handy. This together with natural language parsing and looking at the structure of sentences, we were able to do phrasal grouping. This is a work that won the Best Paper Award in EMEA a couple of years ago. And basically build this uh, uh, structure to form something called fine-grained finding patterns. Once you have those patterns, it's relatively easy to spit out an English language sentence, such as something over here. You can say for the anatomical finding, left basal adelectasis is something that you can spit out. Still, it turns out that even this method would have some issues with negations, which tend to be still a bottleneck for many of these. But we have gotten it down to fairly good accuracy enough that the error that you get from such labeling is tolerable in the building of models. Okay, so now it's time to build models. You've got data, you've got labels, you're time to build models. So the first approach we took was that we are going to label it individually by taking classes of findings, like tubes and lines or technical assessments. And we got pretty good ROC codes with the data sets and the models that we used. But our experiment revealed that actually it is possible to build a one single model that covers all the findings because of the incidence distribution rates. There is something you can do to tune the model towards these findings to adapt for sensitivities and specificities based on the likelihood of occurrence. And as a result, we ended up with building this model, which exploited the latest in computer vision, uh, feature pyramids, dilated blocks, global score pooling for all those who use computer visual models, know these are popular techniques, but put them in unique combinations to do this. Based on that, you can now see the kind of findings we can detect would say something like moderate plural effusion in the right lower low. That's actually a label. So it should be relatively easy now to put forward a sentence that describes it uh, pretty close to that. The system is also able to detect them fairly accurately where these volumes were. So you can see low lung volumes, hyper radiations. Many of them are located uh, correctly as well. So now the question is, how do I generate a report out of this? So obviously, there is uh, labels that are already the findings, distribution that are given. But in order to make sure that the sentence is as natural as possible, we actually exploited prior radiology reports and combined machine learning with document retrieval and a variety of techniques to actually construct sentences out of those. So these would then have the problem that they would be actually natural language, uh, natural language-like, but also describe the findings as correctly as possible. We did these evaluations and we have published papers, so you can see some of the sentences that are being generated by such a report generation method. Okay, so in the last section, I will talk about how we said we were going to build a machine that was comparable, and how do we prove that? So we had to now conduct studies on the radiologist side to actually build benchmark data sets. So we used a ground truth labeling process called triple consensus with adjudication as a validation, and then brought them and actually recorded nearly 2,000 chest X-rays as uh, with the ground truth labels across 60 plus findings. And then we looked at the performance of entry level radiologists on detecting these and then compared them with machines in an objective way as we could. And this is the paper in JAMA. 
And you can see from this ROC curves that for some findings, radiologists are better than machines, and for others, machines are better than radiologists, and for some of these, like normal abnormal discrimination, they're right on the curve as such. So in fact, the overall conclusion from that was that there isn't much statistical, statistically significant difference between sensitivities of AI and radiologists, but specificities, you can actually tune them to be much higher for machines based on the performance considerations that you choose and the prevalence distributions of these labels as such. So this was actually encouraging that we can actually find machines that are capable of achieving this performance. So this, you can see some of the performances of which ones radiologists are good at and which ones machines are good at. Okay, so now come to the last part of it, which is building a Turing test for radiology AI. How do we do that? So one of the methodology, this is something we did with partnership with un universities as well, and we rolled out initial versions at RSNA, and then later on at a final demonstration at a symposium where we had these interfaces actually given to attendings to go and look at chest X-rays and their reports already generated with an unknown process and have them rate this. So this is the final result that came from here and I want to focus a little bit of time on this and describe to you the event and the excitement that it generated when we were in this symposium. We had actually set aside three dark rooms for uh, attendings to go and evaluate and the, dis the reports that were randomly collected had to, were actually distributed among these three radiologists. One of them just got machine reports, one of them got radiologist reports, one of them got a mixture, but none of them were told who got what. So that's what they did. They went and, they went and evaluated them, and the kind of um, results that they were looking for is to see if they are quality from a diagnostic purpose, whether it's an excellent quality report. So these are criteria that American College of Radiology also uses, and, uh, and, then, and then a perception score in some sense of the satisfaction for how, good are you, how well are you satisfied with the report that you have. And then we were watching the distributions as the numbers were coming in. And we hoped and prayed that our numbers would look better. <laughs> so, so you can see from here, the, across the four uh, categories that we looked, when we overlay the two, you can see that the reads for at least for this batch of things that we, uh, we used, it seemed to have come out better on the ex more excellent quality reports uh, than, uh, than for the radiologists in this particular case. And then the impression scores also went um, along these lines. Okay, to summarize, what we did was something that was attempting a grand challenge going from end to end, because we started at a place where we said we'll take on a goal saying, how can we show how good are machines? But we actually, talking about human-centered AI, the previous speaker, we had to actually go back and see how good are the humans. And most of the studies and quotations, about 26% error rate in radiologists, is anecdotal or for specific findings. But if you now have this many class of findings, how good are they? Now, you, know, you have to actually do those studies as well. It would be nice if someone else did those studies, but given a team and where we were going with this and the duration, we had to recruit different institutions and come work with them collectively to go through this process as such. So this is a lesson learned in data science is that the next wave of things that you will see in AI models come after is go after fine-grained findings. I think the coarse grains have already been addressed now, and in future you will see machines going after things that are much more finer level of detail when it comes to perceiving things. Thank you. <laughs>